Hi, I'm Thomas, and I'm going to be telling you about algorithms with more granular differential privacy guarantees. I'll start by giving some background and motivation, and the, the high-level question is, how do we interpret large privacy parameters? Uh, and that's going to lead us to defining per-attribute privacy or partial differential privacy. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about some algorithms that provide per-attribute privacy guarantees. So I'm going to look at the tasks of K-way marginals, histograms, and learning hub spaces. And then we'll wrap up. Now, I hope uh, many of you are familiar with differential privacy, but I'll, I'll give a brief introduction. The setting is as follows. We've collected the private data of several people. We've stuck that through some processing algorithm, and that's produced statistical information, which we're going to release to the, the whole world. Now, the concern is that that statistical information that we made publicly available is going to leak some sensitive details about the people whose data we've uh, collected. And we want to prevent that. And the way we formalize preventing that is differential privacy. So the way we, we do that is we consider the real world that I just described to you in an ideal world where your data has been completely removed from the input. Now, the ideal and real worlds are going to give you different distributions on outputs. And the guarantee of differential privacy is simply that these output distributions are similar. So any event E, the probability it occurs in the real world is the most E to the epsilon times the probability it occurs in the ideal world plus delta. Now, I'm going to ignore delta because that should be very small. But the intuitive interpretation of this is that if there's any bad outcome that you're concerned about, the probability that this occurs in the real world is at most e to the epsilon times the probability it occurs in the ideal world. Now, ideally, of course, the ideal world has a very low probability of that bad outcome occurring. OK, so how does this interpretation work? Now, if epsilon is 0.1, then that means the probability of a bad event increases by at most a 1.1 factor. Epsilon equals 1 is a 2.7 factor at most. Epsilon equals 3 is at most a 20-fold increase in the probability of a bad outcome. But if we set epsilon larger, things rapidly start to fall apart. So epsilon equals 10 means we're looking at a 20,000-fold increase in the probability of a bad outcome. And once you reach epsilon equals 20, the probability of a bad outcome could increase by a factor of a billion. Now, this is, uh, I want to emphasize that this is not a vacuous guarantee, but it's definitely getting quite hard to interpret this. But despite this, uh, a, a minority of real world applications of differential privacy do consider large values of epsilon greater than 10. So there's a disconnect here. We, we're using large values of epsilon, but we don't have a good way to interpret it because we're facing this exponential cliff. Now, there is an informal intuition that I think a lot of people have, which basically says that if your algorithm is, is nice, if the data is natural, and if the adversary or attacker that you're worried about is realistic, then the real privacy guarantee is bad. Instead of this exponential cliff, it's going to be a, a much more gradual failure as epsilon becomes large. The high-level question, of course, is can we formalize this intuition? Now, I think it's important to be able to formalize this and give explicit and robust guarantees because it should be falsifiable. We don't want to be in a situation where we just have a hand-wavy intuition that says large epsilons are always good. We should know what the criteria are for when it's OK uh, and, and when it, it definitely is not OK. So what we look at in this work is what are nice algorithms? Can we formalize this? Can we construct some? So our contribution specifically is that we're going to design some, some algorithms that satisfy a more granular DP guarantee that we present as a way of formalizing an algorithm being nice. OK, so what do these nice DP algorithms look like? I think the easiest way to address this question is to flip it around and ask, what do worst-case differentially private algorithms look like? 
And the canonical example is randomized response on your most sensitive attribute. So just imagine your most sensitive binary attribute. It could be whether you have some disease, or whether you're pregnant, whether you've committed some kind of crime. And now imagine an algorithm that takes that attribute and correctly outputs it, whoops, with probability one over one plus e to the minus epsilon, and with probability one over one plus e to the plus epsilon, these two add up to one, it will, it will flip the bit and output the reversed value. Now this satisfies epsilon differential privacy, but if epsilon becomes large, so epsilon equals 10, would mean that you're re revealing the sensitive bit with 99.995% accuracy. Um, so obviously this is not a good algorithm, and intuitively what's unnatural about it is that it is spending such a huge amount of privacy budget, epsilon equals 10, on a single binary attribute. And this uh, is not nice, and we want to formalize, we want to formulate something that rules this out. And that's what leads us to uh, per attribute differential privacy. Uh, so we have uh, various generalizations of this definition, but let's just stick with uh, per attribute differential privacy. So an algorithm is going to satisfy epsilon naught per attribute dp if for all pairs of inputs x and x prime that differ only on a single attribute of a single person. The output distributions are similar in the, the usual sense that the probability of any event can increase by most of either the epsilon naught multiplicative factor. Now, how this differs from the standard definition of differential privacy is that the standard definition allows me to change a single person's data arbitrarily. Now we're saying you can only make a small change to a person's data. Now, this intuitively corresponds to making an assumption about the adversary. We're basically saying the adversary is only interested in a few attributes, so a single attribute or a function of a couple of attributes. So this protects against a class of attacks, but it doesn't protect against everything. So for example, it doesn't protect against membership inference. It doesn't protect whether or not you're in the data set because that's a function of all of your attributes. Uh, that being said, if you have epsilon zero per attribute dp and you have d attributes, then you have epsilon dp under the standard definition where epsilon is equal to epsilon naught times d. So you still get a standard dp guarantee as a corollary of per attribute dp. Now the claim I want to make is that if I tell you my algorithm satisfies per attribute dp with epsilon naught equals one, and there are 10 attributes, this is more informative than just telling you that we have a 10 DP guarantee. And it, hopefully there are scenarios where you might be willing to accept this kind of algorithm when you are not comfortable with just a, a 10 DP guarantee. So this is giving you more information and in particular is trying to encode something about how nice the algorithm is. Okay, so now is a good time to situate this work relative to what's been done before. So in terms of definitions, there are plenty of papers that have given definitions which are more or less equivalent to our definition of per attribute DP, aka partial DP. Uh, one thing that we did that is new is that we looked at a concentrated DP variant of partial DP, which I think is uh, important because uh, it gives you better co uh, composition. But what I want to emphasize is our contributions on the algorithmic side. So if you look at the prior work, pretty much all of it looks at some variant of the Laplace mechanism where you just change the sensitivity to, to match your definition, or rather you change your definition to match your sensitivity. There's also some work that looks at the, the Gaussian mechanism, but overall the, the algorithmic toolkit in the prior work is quite limited. So that's what we're trying to address in this work, and we're going to present a couple of different algorithms. So just as a startup, we're going to look at the projection mechanism, which gives you average error guarantees for families of queries. We're also going to look at a variant of the multiplicative weights uh, exponential mechanism, which is something more like a <clears throat> max error guarantee over the queries. 
We're also going to look at histograms, aka heavy hitters, and robust Haas based learning. Uh, and the overall message that I want to emphasize about our algorithmic results is that we show a separation. So we show that there are settings where it's possible to have a small per attribute guarantee, but the um, per person standard epsilon is going to be large. So this is a setting where uh, having this additional information, a per attribute guarantee, could be useful. OK, let's uh, start talking about our algorithms. Let's talk about uh, KOA margins. Um, so here, our data is a vector of d-bits for each person. And let's start with one-way marginals. So one-way marginals are just the mean of all of the attributes. Now, under standard DP, this is a very easy task. Very standard task, we're going to add Laplace noise to each attribute mean. And the scale of the Laplace noise needs to scale uh, with the number of uh, attributes uh, by composition. Uh, under per attribute DP, the scale of the, we also can add Laplace noise, but the scale doesn't grow with the number of attributes. Now, this is a, a, a trivial uh, algorithm. We're just exploiting the fact that we're doing per attribute DP and computing per attribute statistics. So, where things get a bit more interesting is if we look at K way conjunctions. So a uh, K-way conjunction, basically, I'm going to pick all sets of size K, subsets of attributes, take conjunctions, and I'll put the mean of those conjunctions. So now I have a much larger set of queries. And each query can depend on a number of attributes. There's no clear way I can separate them out into per attribute sets of queries. So a standard algorithm for this is the projection mechanism. Uh, it's, it's actually very simple. You add Gaussian noise to each of the queries, uh, and then you do a projection step. So you take the noisy answers, and you find you reconstruct some data set Y that is as close, that whose answers are as close to those noisy answers as possible. And this projection step greatly uh, decreases the error. And we can analyze this under per attribute DP. Now, if you compare the standard DP guarantee here, uh, if you look, uh, we're looking at concentrated DP, but I, I want to ignore that detail. If you look at the average error over the query, so the number of queries is m, I'm averaging over all the queries, this is a vector of query answers. The error grows uh, as the minimum of two terms. So the first term is just the guarantee I would get from noise addition. This grows with the, the number of queries m, so this is not very good if I have a large family of queries. But the second one, the second term, is what I get from the projection mechanism. And here we see that the error grows as the square root of the dimension. Square root of the dimension of epsilon times n. Under per attribute, I can, under per attribute privacy, I can add less noise. Uh, and then the guarantee, the error grows not with D, but with K. So instead of the total dimension, I only need to look at the dimension of the queries. So there's a there's a, a separation here. However, this is just for average error. I have to average over all the queries. So it could be that 99% of my queries have great error, but 1% have terrible error. So that's why we're interested in also getting guarantees for maximum error. Okay, so let's Keep looking at KOA marginals, KOA conjunctions, and look at the maximum error. So a standard algorithm for this is the multiplicative weights exponential mechanism, uh, which is based on the earlier private multiplicative weights equivalent. The algorithm uh, is simply described as follows. So we maintain a distribution over the, the data domain. And the goal is to make that distribution uh, match the private data set in the sense that it gives answers that are close to the, the true answers. What we do is we use the exponential mechanism to select one query, such that there's a big difference between the answer on that distribution we're maintaining and on the private data set. Once we've identified that query, we're going to reweight the distribution using the multiplicative weights update rule so the distribution's answer matches the true answer. 
Uh, and then we're going to repeat. And the, the nice guarantee of multiplicative weights is that this is going to rapidly converge. And the way we modify this to give uh, per attribute guarantees is that rather than picking one query at a time, we're going to pick multiple queries in parallel. Uh, and here is the algorithm in all its gory detail. Uh, I don't want to go through it. One thing to note is that there's a parameter L, which is the number of queries we uh, sample in parallel. If L equals 1, we get exactly the standard algorithm. And we're going to set L to be something like D over K to get a better guarantee. So the standard guarantee for multiplicative weights is that the maximum error over all the queries uh, is, is this expression. If we look at the per attribute guarantee, uh, per attribute privacy guarantee, we basically get to substitute the D with a K. So again, we're going to replace the uh, total dimension with just the dimension of the queries. And that's a big win because we're often interested in queries with dimension like two or three. Uh, but this is the log D term that appears. Uh, there, there's an important caveat on this result. So we don't actually get to bound the maximum error. We get to bound the worst case error averaged over a set of L attribute disjoint queries. So it's an open problem to, to close that gap. OK, great. So I've told you about the projection mechanism of multiplicative weights, which are algorithms for answering families of queries, such as KOE marginals. Let's look at histograms. So I'll, I'll give you some background on histograms. So the data is just a set of points in some domain x. We're going to take x to be uh, 0, 1 to the d, so d attributes. And we're interested in the frequency of a given element y. So the frequency of y is the number of times y occurs in x1 through xn. Now, the histogram is to out Put, the, the histogram problem is to output f sub y for every y up to some additive error. The heavy hitters is a closely related problem, basically an equivalent problem, where I ask you to output a list of all y's that occur with a certain frequency. Um, uh, these problems are basically equivalent, except that the heavy hitters is asking for a succinct representation. Uh, now, this problem is extremely well studied in differential privacy. Most of the time, people consider variants of the problem we have communication or computation constraints, which we're not looking at. Uh, but the canonical algorithm, if you're not worried about communication or computation, is just to add Laplace or Gaussian noise uh, to each of the frequency counts uh, independently. Now, the scale of the noise. Uh, is 1 over epsilon. And it's important to know that this doesn't depend on the domain size. This is because adding or removing one person only changes the frequency of one element. Uh, now, the maximum error is then just obtained by a union bound. So there's 2 to the d elements. We take a union bound over 2 to the d Laplace noise samples. We get error d of epsilon. And there's an additional trick we can throw into this. So we can truncate the noise. So if we have delta greater than 0, approximate differential privacy, we can truncate the noise at log 1 over delta over epsilon. And then we can get an error bound that's independent of the dimension d. Now, I've just given you an algorithm, which is very good. In a sense, people understand that histograms are easy under standard differential privacy, which raises the question, why would you want to consider per attribute differential privacy for an easy problem like histograms. And the reason I think this is interesting is that the histogram algorithm I just described is, an, in a sense, a worst case algorithm. It's precisely the kind of algorithm that we don't we want to rule out with, with partial DP because it's not nice. And to illustrate why that is the case, let's suppose I'm the adversary and I'm trying to figure out whether or not your data is included. So there's a membership inference question. Now, assuming the histogram is sparse, so there's no collisions, this is just the question of asking, is f sub y 1 or f sub y 0, where y is your data? Similarly, I might 
want to know what your secret bit is. So I know that your data is Y0 or Y1. I'm trying to figure out which. This just works out to figuring out is, is the pair F Y0, F Y1, 1, 0, or 0, 1. And the problem is, if the privacy parameter epsilon is greater than one, then the scale of the noise that I'm adding, that, that the, the algorithm is adding, is less than one, which means I should be able to distinguish between these. So we actually get this exponential cliff, where uh, as epsilon gets larger than three or 10 or whatever, the probability that I can figure out your secret information is very high. And to make matters worse, if I apply this trick of truncating the noise, then this roughly corresponds to saying I'm going to release your data in the clear with probability delta. So histograms are uh, an easy problem, but they're also a worst case problem. OK, so let me describe our algorithm for heavy hitters, which avoids this worst case uh, this worst case behavior by looking at per attribute privacy. So the key idea is to take the attributes, split them, and then recursively compute heavy hitters on the subsets. So if you look at the diagram I have here, I've got a table, each row is one person's data. I'm gonna split it up based on the columns. I'm gonna compute the recursively compute the, the heavy hitters on the left and the heavy hitters on the right. Um, and now, once I have those heavy hitters, I can concatenate those heavy hitters from the left and the right. And this is giving me a short list of all the heavy hitters at the top. So I only need to look at the frequency f sub y for y that's on my short list. So when we're doing the analysis of this algorithm, this means we only need to do the union bound over the short lists rather than over the exponential set of all possible strings. And in terms of the privacy analysis, each attribute is only looked at on the path from the root to the uh, from the root to the leaf. So we can do a, a rough privacy analysis. So we can split the privacy budget epsilon naught to epsilon naught over log d for each level. If you look at the total size of the shortlist, so over the entire tree, this is roughly polynomial in D. So I'll take a union bound over polynomial in D, the plus noise draws, where each has scale log D of epsilon naught. And that gives me a maximum error of log squared D over epsilon naught. Uh, it turns out we can actually shave that lot, one of those logs by doing some clever accounting, which I, I won't go into. Uh, so we get max error log d of epsilon. So the separation here is that under standard DP, the max error uh, is d over epsilon. This is for pure DP, so not a delta. Uh, and under per attribute DP, it's log d of epsilon naught. So there's an exponential separation here for pure DP. Okay, so I've told you about three algorithms. Unfortunately, I don't have time to tell you about robust half space learning. You'll have to take a look at the paper. Uh, so let's uh, give, a, give a summary and wrap up. So again, the motivation for this work is finding ways to interpret large epsilon by providing some additional information by breaking it up into a more granular guarantee. Um, and we're trying to capture this intuition that nice algorithms spread their privacy budget of the attributes that are spin up all on a single attribute. Um, this corresponds to making some assumption about the adversary specifically that they're only interested in one or two attributes. Um, obviously, the, there's limitations here. It doesn't protect against membership inference attacks because that's a function of all your attributes. Uh, and in general, the interpretation of this kind of guarantee is context dependent. If you don't want to do context dependent things, you're stuck with standard differential privacy. Uh, and our main technical contribution is that we provide several algorithms that give per attribute differential privacy guarantees for KOA marginals, heavy hitters, half spaces. In all these cases, we show there's a separation between the standard per person epsilon and the per attribute epsilon. And I think our work demonstrates that there's something algorithmically interesting that can be done uh, in the per attribute DP world. 
Uh, so lastly, let's talk about some further work. Um, obviously, the high-level question of interpreting privacy guarantees is still open. Uh, a couple of thoughts on this. I think whatever justification we come up for tolerating larger epsilons than we can interpret normally uh, should be falsifiable. It shouldn't just apply everywhere. There should be specific conditions under which that justification works. Uh, and we should not be aiming to replace differential privacy with a new definition. It should just be a way of uh, supplementing it with providing, providing additional information. Uh, obviously, other direction for further work, designing and analyzing more algorithms. I, I think we have only scratched the surface in this work. Um, there's also natural extensions, like having different uh, epsilons for different attributes. Obviously, not all attributes are equally sensitive. Uh, and I think the, a great question would be to find applications where this kind of formalism actually is providing useful additional information. Thank you very much for listening.